Good evening, Becky. How are you doing? I'm doing Hi. great, Dr. Ping. Good morning. I got so Good used morning. To I know. Are we at evening already? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got so used to like uh, interview people uh, in the evening. Oh, okay. Uh, sometimes I, I do that in the morning. Just depends on uh, availability. So, um, and which districts you are running? I'm running in District 25, which is made up of most of Zionsville, all of Whitestown, okay. about half of Brownsburg, and a couple precincts in Lebanon. Oh, okay. Uh, you, so District 25, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you have an uh, incumbent that you are running against? No, it's a newly drawn district, oh, okay. so there is no incumbent. Okay. So... Uh, so what made you decide to run for the office? I mean, right. Well, it's not a word. Obviously, right? it's, it's a little bit of a um, insane thing for a mom of six to decide to. But I've been in the activism community for the last 16 years. And, you know, activism can get a bad name right? right because we see all the radical stuff on TV. But I just mean that I have been fighting for parental rights um, as a naturopathic practitioner. I've been working with my clients, helping them to navigate the medical system, helping them um, to get the services they need as far as special needs, but also calling legislators and more recently over the last couple of years testifying at the state house. Right. And really what what's happened in the last two plus years is that we've come to realize that many of our legislators are just not listening. Some of them quite honestly have been there for so long that they don't care. Right. And the ones listening they're not fighting for right. the people. And so it really just, we really just reached a crux in the road where we came to realize that if more of us did not get on the inside, that we were not going to be able to make the change that we've been trying so hard to make on the outside. And quite honestly, in Indiana, up until the last two and a half years, I would have told all of my friends, move to Indiana. We are a safe state. We are a great state to raise children. We are a free state. And we are losing that really quickly. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I decided to run. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I uh, I was invo involved with uh, there's two bills, uh, SB 1134 and yeah. no, SB, HB 1134 and SB 17. So I, yes. I went to State House and uh, gave my testimony. And uh, it, uh, it won't take long to realize that uh, those people there, they were just playing games. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. and, and House Bill 1001, I know you had actually on recently, but they were completely playing games. I mean, the Senate, the Senate couldn't have made it clear. I mean, they didn't even pretend like they were, they right. were going to do anything with that. Right. After seven hours of people driving all across the state to testify on that, hire babysitters, take time off of work. Right. They literally left in that evening. They said, oh, never mind." Right. <laughs> so. right exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think in the past, the, uh, well, somehow, I guess we are uh, in a way in in a, in in the in a illusion that uh, those people are uh, self-claimed conservatives, uh, mm -hmm. Republicans, and all that. But actually, when they are uh, uh, making the, the 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 laws and the bills and all that, they definitely do not behave as conservatives. Right. Yeah. right. Well, and that's a good point because something that's been frustrating for me is to listen to all of these legislators um, tell us, oh, I agree with you. I agree right. with you. But you just have to understand that, um, that we can't do that. But they're actually the only ones who can. They are the legislators. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Or they will say, okay, uh, we did on our side, but it's the Senate. Right. Well, the Senate Center said it's the House, <laughs> so they just can't. <laughs> well, you found that out. I mean, you yeah. pegged that exactly when you talked about HB 1134 and then SB 17. Right. So if this really was all the fault of the Senate, then why did the House not hear and pass SB 17 once it got over to them? So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I, I cannot hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Now. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I was just saying that they pretty much showed their cards because right. if they really were on our side, why did they not listen to and and pass SB 17? That was right. such a clean bill. Such exactly. a clean bill. Yeah, exactly. And then they, they just, uh, that 
so they passed in the Senate, but when that went to the House, and it didn't even come out from the committee. Right. They said they didn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> they, <laughs> they have time for other things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think uh, uh, I am uh, encouraged to see people like you uh, who are running uh, for office this time. I have uh, met several, uh, like, moms. So they, they basically, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, you uh, you had enough, right? <laughs> yes, yes, we, we've had enough. And I mean, honestly, I have six children ages nine to 22 years old. And I genuinely, truly love Indiana. We moved here 16 years ago. We moved because we... Oh, sorry. Uh, I cannot hear you again. We, hmm. I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, right. Okay. Just like all of a sudden, uh, no sound. Yeah, it's a, it says the internet connection is unstable. Oh, okay. Yeah, could be not that, sure. like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, right. So you're talking about, in, well, Indiana is a conservative uh, a state. Uh, but the water I found is uh, what's happening in the school uh, or in schools that well, uh, there are so many bad things going on, and uh, uh, the, I mean, the schools, uh, administrations, and uh, not really doing anything on that. And and some actually uh, is actually uh, quite woke. Um, <laughs> right. I think the smaller school districts are really still trying to, um, you know, maintain that. Right. Indiana feel right, but right. the larger the schools get, the more difficult um, right. it becomes. So, so um, uh, are you homeschooling your your children? Yes. So, um, three of our children are still are still minors. So, our seventeen year old, um, she is homeschooled, and we do some online classes okay. through uh, a place called Homeschool Connections, mm. um, which is actually a faith-based program. So you wouldn't okay. know it from the name, but it's faith-based, and we can pick and choose classes, which is nice because she can get all of her upper-level science classes and math classes and such. And then we have a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. And last year, I helped to start a hybrid school okay. at our church. And so two days a week, they go there. And what's nice about it is that the parents are still in control, right. but we hired teachers two days a week to facilitate so that oh, okay. I can do things like this. I um, see. But the other other two days, two or three days, depending on what grade level they're at, we oh, are doing okay. the work at home. Right, right. So, so it's kind of like- Sometimes a, we're doing it on Sunday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a kind of homework uh, co-op, right? The one you have- Well, your, it's, I'm, yes, we wouldn't really call it a, a homework because- um, we really are teaching the lessons on the days when they are at home and then the teachers are teaching them on the other days. So they're right. not just doing their homework at home, but yes, it, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've seen that like, there is a, uh, like homeschool and homeschool co-op, I guess mm -hmm. even for the co-op, there are some are quite informal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some, some of them are, some of them, they get together for playing and, um, but ours is ours is definitely structured. They wear uniforms and but oh, they, you know, okay. they get to play and uh, that's faith based also. That's just our choice. So there's so many options in Indiana for homeschooling. So yeah. And you mentioned the uh, uh, homeschool connect. That's the online school. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And we pick and choose. So some online schools are actually full blown schools. You do all of your subjects there. Right. But this one, um, for example, my daughter is doing her biology through there she's done mm. um she did a world economics class which they actually studied um micro businesses oh, in neat. other countries and right. such which she would not be getting that in a regular public school no, so no, no. yeah I thought, this is not the economy they're teaching in school <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah i think one thing i i see that uh, uh it's a Im very important subject is entrepreneurship is to teach the kids how to be on their own, how to uh, think in terms as a business owners yeah. instead of just as an employee or as 
to right. work for someone. Yeah. yeah, I think it's become more and more uh, now that uh, uh, because the, the global economy and the internet and all that, it's now it's very easy to start your own business. Right. And that, that also gives you a lot of flexibility. And especially if you're going to uh, homeschool your children, then have a uh, business, uh, you know, right. that reason. Well, it allows yeah. us, yeah, it allows us to tailor the classes that she's taking because right. he does struggle with math quite mm. a bit. Okay. And so we've really had to sit there and say, okay, what does she need mathematically right. in order to do? It's actually better for her to understand personal money management yeah. than have upper level math classes and cry her way through it. Right, right. So we're yeah. actually able to tailor the education more to uh, what she needs. And then the other thing is that a lot of the, well, some of the universities like Marion University or even Ivy Tech, they are now offering classes, uh, even junior and senior year in high school. I just oh, heard nice. about a young lady who graduated from high school uh -huh. with her degree from a college at the same time. And yeah. I've known a lot of students who have, you know, graduated with multiple credits and right, such, right, right. both as homeschoolers and in the public schools. But that was pretty impressive too. Yeah, uh, it is. That, that's so. true. that's very good. Yeah, I, I know a young man, he actually has a, a, a company that uh, uh, allow, help people to take a uh, clap. Uh, so, so, oh. Basically, you can, uh, well, he actually got his degree uh, within a year by okay. taking, taking all the exams. Right. So that way right. you don't have to, to, I mean, have to waste the time to. Right. Uh, well, even just talking about what's going on in schools, I think this is a really important topic that I'm trying to share. I was just talking um, when we were knocking on doors yesterday okay. to a dad with a high school student uh, on the autism spectrum. But she's she's high functioning, right. you know. She's she's gonna go on and she's gonna do things. And I was explaining that my own daughter, who just turned twenty, she got her CNA in nursing as a senior in high school. Mm. She graduated in the COVID class of two thousand and twenty. Oh. So when all of her peers uh, went home, she went head to toe, actually in plastic garbage bags into the oh. nursing home because they didn't have PPE. Right. And now she's working in the nursing homes in memory and dementia. And she'd like to go back and start taking classes towards her nursing. Right. She literally graduated from high school. And actually she did that through our public school system. And uh, okay. that, that was an opportunity that they give where they can take certifications through J Everett light. And what was really cool is that, uh, she actually got cords from Ivy Tech because it was uh, from Ivy Tech and graduated um, magna sum laude ooh, with those cords. Wow. And for a young lady who struggled her whole life in school, mm. um, she was my first first child, young wow. adult, to get cords. And so for her, it was just very empowering. And she's now she's now talking about getting her own apartment and getting her own furniture, and right. she's making money. I mean, she's financially able to do that. Whereas right. a lot of students have spent the last two years struggling in college to even get in-person classes. Right. So, but those opportunities are available at a lot of our area high schools, whether it be the public high schools, um, the Catholic high schools. And so any parent who's listening to this, I just, I really want parents to know that there are options out there because more and more students are realizing that either college is not for them right. or it, it's crazy out there. My son went to Ball State University and even when they went back in person, mm. his two hour classes were 45 minutes. And he finally said, I'm not learning anything. <sighs> and so parents really need to know there are, there are really viable options right. out there. Yeah. And so my son came home after two years and I won't tell you how much he's making, but he's making a lot of money as a contract employee <laughs> out there doing construction, learning to drive forklifts. Right. Like, it's just my husband and I both have college uh, educations. We both have degrees. I have multiple degrees, but this is, it's a different world we're living in. Exactly. And also, I think uh, in a way we, we have been conditioned that we need to go to, I mean, our kids needs to go to college. I mean, right. I mean, uh, I mean, there there is a, a definitely a good reason to go there, but right. uh, and college, they also have different 
right? Different majors will uh, right. they're going into. And uh, so just going to college doesn't really make it nowadays. And also, on the other hand, you have the tuitions went up so much that it's so easy to get into a huge debt. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. was something that my husband said. He never wanted our kids to go into debt to go to right. college. And there's some amazing universities out there. And he just said, you know what? There just isn't any reason for them to go into debt. And we don't have forty to sixty thousand dollars a year to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah. wasn't that wasn't in our um, budgeting plan. Right. So. <laughs> and and also like uh, you you know the time is different now, right? Uh, right. In the past, let's like say 30, 40 years ago, when you get a, venture, a college degree, you can get a decent job. But now this is not the case. Even if you oh, have yeah. a college degree, you may not get a, a good, good job. Right. So. Well, and this is an important topic because even at the legislative level, we need to do more things to open up the opportunities for uh, to encourage trade schools right. and to encourage those opportunities out there and so even at the legislative level um, that is something that we can look at where our money is going in the state budget mm -hmm. and there there are a couple of my kids graduated from Zionsville High School I literally asked why do you only tell the kids in special education about these opportunities to get certifications and a few years ago I was told because the parents are not open to their kids being told anything else I, I genuinely think that the people who told me that believe that, but I can assure you that even in a community like Zionsville, Brownsburg, um, the, you know, these areas, Westfield and such, parents are really open to this now. I actually made a post on our community page a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. It blew up. I mean, three or 400 comments and people were like, wait a minute. I didn't know that this option was here. And then I got nervous. Uh -huh. I thought, uh -huh. are we going to blow the budget for the, for the school system? All of these students, because I mean, they can literally, they can get culinary right. um, certifications, vet, vet tech, med tech through J Everett light. And then mm -hmm. other school districts go to have options through other programs. Right. And so legislatively, we, we really, so much of our money has been poured into um, encouraging our students to go to college. Right. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, buying for any one treasure, um, treasure candidate right now, but I do know that one of them is talking about the fact that we have really promoted uh, the state, um, the state savings program as being for college, but in actuality, families can use that for trade school um, and then even bank that money. Students can bank that money for later on. Um, okay. But since so much of it has been talked about, save money for college, college, right. college, college. And college is fantastic. If you're going to become a surgeon, please go to college. Right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not anti-college at right. all or university. Um, we, we wanted our kids even with homeschooling, whether they were homeschooling in Catholic schools and public schools, our entire goal was to raise our children and educate our children so they had the ability right. to make the decisions that were best for them. If we exactly. didn't give them the education they needed to be able to move on. And so, uh, you know, and yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there's so there's so many places we can go with that, right? So right, I'll be right, quiet right. and let you ask me your next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 thank you. That's very good. I mean, and, I love this topic. Uh, yeah, the reason I, I, uh, I started this channel, uh, one is to uh, 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 make a parents aware of what is going on and what are the options. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially the harm right now is in the, uh, our schools. And secondly, is like uh, to talk to people like you, I, I also learn a lot. <laughs> so there's a yes. kind of my self interest too, but uh, uh, right. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I taught in a college prep school, so uh, that's where we kind of always uh, uh, tell our students you need to go to college, you need to go to college. But we didn't really make the distinction about like, uh, well, what kind of college you should go to, what major should go to, what is the, uh, you know, what is your, uh, how much money that uh what's the debt right 
the student loans, what that means, and uh, the, so that that in, in, you, you incur and what is the job of, um, uh, aspect for those majors. So we didn't talk about that. We just say, okay, go to college, go to college. And also the parents also push their kids to go to college. So at least I me, mean, I know some kids uh, in my school or in my class, they, they, they go to college because their parents want them to. And that is in a way not healthy uh, for those students because they just go there. They think that, okay, <laughs> they don't have the self-motivation. It's just basically, okay, you want me to go to school, go, go to college, I go to college. <laughs> yeah, so they are not really uh, learning. At least they are not in a way they are, they don't think this as their own future in a way, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, okay, now you uh, uh, you want to run and the, uh, the, I, I'm, what kind of issues you are running on? Right, so um, so my key issues are medical freedom. There mm. is absolutely no reason why we should not have medical freedom protection in our state right now. Right. And we absolutely should have legislation that says that nobody can be forced or mandated. And it's really important when people are looking at who to vote for to look between the lines of what is not being said by the person who is, is running. So for example, um, I have three people running mm. against me mm. and every one of them will say that the government should not mandate people to get a vaccine or a medical treatment because really we're not talking about this, but if you can mandate someone to get a vaccine, what else can you mandate? Right, them to right. do? You know, what in regards to that, can you, can you mandate a woman to use birth control so she doesn't get pregnant? You know, where mm. else can that, can that go? But what they're not, saying is that they don't believe the government should be able to mandate it but do they believe that businesses should oh, be allowed okay and so do they believe that private businesses should mm. be allowed to do that so people have to dig deeper into that question and we have some pretty big lobbying groups in our state that are really well, they're tying the hands of the legislators because the legislators are beholden to them. Mm. So they're not going to tie my hands because, first of all, they're not endorsing me. They're not right. giving me money. Right. And I wouldn't take money from an organization where I was going to be beholden like that. So medical freedom, mm -hmm. um, parental parental rights. It's, it's interesting because in the last year, we've been talking about parental voice in education mm -hmm. and parents having a voice in education. People know, even knowing what the curriculum is. But that topic of parental rights is so much bigger than that because medical injury is the number three cause of death in our country oh, wow. and in our state, I believe. And so a lot of parents, myself included as a mother, have been um, scared into letting doctors do things, into getting medical treatments out of fear that the Department of Children and Family Services was going to be called and come in. And mm. so a lot of times, you know, people will say, well, if, if my child had X, Y, Z, I wouldn't do this, this, or this. And I just kind of have to smile in the background and think, yes, yes, actually you would, because that's what, um, my doorbell's about to ring. So my uh -huh. husband won't get it, but just letting uh -huh. you guys know. Okay. Um, anyway, so that topic of parental rights, parental rights in the way you choose to educate your children, in the medical decisions that you make, um, in the religion that you yeah. practice, um, as long as you're not physically or sexually abusing your children, right. the state needs to stay out of, of parents' lives, in my in my opinion. And that is right. something that I will fight very hard for, as well as watch for where legislation um, whether it be in the schools or whether it be with the Department of Children and Family Services or <clears throat> any state entity um, imposing in a parent's right to make the decisions that are best for them. Mm -hmm. I am 100% pro-life um, with yeah. no exceptions from the unborn. I'm very concerned about our elderly, those with special needs, those with medical needs. Um, people like to say that people who are pro-life don't care about the mother. That is absolutely completely no. not true they like right. to say we don't care about them once they're born right. um we've been foster parents so that is 
absolutely not true. Um, we've right. taken young adults into our home. So those are definitely three core issues. And then I'm very, very concerned about our mental health crisis that was already big before the pandemic. Yeah, it is. Our suicide rates in Indiana are, yeah. are out of control. I mean, right. we're, we're not doing well. We're not a healthy state right now. But we can be, and I really believe in Indiana. And in fact, because there is no state that is a good example of mental health right now, I believe that if we get it right in Indiana, mm -hmm. we could actually become the example for the country. Right. And, uh, oh, that excites me too. Yeah, definitely. Think about the possibilities with that, and not just the possibility; it's a necessity. Yeah. We are. It, there is a six to nine month waiting list for pediatric psychiatry right now in our state. That is not okay. Okay. Yeah, I I, uh, I heard a case, when you talk about parental rights, I heard a case, it's a, a 12 year old uh, girl, she wants to become a boy. So, uh, so the school actually uh, uh, get her to uh, get on some kind of hormone treatment without uh, the awareness or and the oh. approval of the parents. And was that in Indiana? Indiana, yeah. And that, the, is, that is definitely not legal in Indiana. Yeah, but but I was told that the, in our current law, that uh, uh, the school can do that. So, so school, they can or can't. They can. So they can school, well, right. Yeah. So they can can do it uh, without the parental approval. Uh, right. That came in with um, that came in with a lot of the grant money and funding that was accepted from the Lilly grants because a okay. few years ago we, you know, everyone talked about these Lilly grants and they were going to help with mental health in the schools and such. Which I I asked parents to really ask themselves: Do you want your school doing mental health? First right. of all, the school's not competent to do right. it. Um, they certainly don't have psychiatrists and stuff in there. Um, but we talk about our state budget is now 51% education. Yeah. And I says, that's fantastic. But let's look in the, at the nuts and bolts because right. I thought, wow, 51%, that's fantastic. But let's look at the nuts and bolts. But so yeah. this grant money came in and when they accept the Lilly grants and uh, they started accepting other funding in order to do that kind of hidden in there was these these caveats and these permissions to mm. overstep the parents. And then the other thing is that I know that our attorney general, you know, he's written two versions of the Parents' Bill of Rights. Mm. But in writing that, a lot of what he's trying to make people understand is that we have laws and the attorney general can only impose what is already in the law. Right. And that we need to get our legislators to pass laws that protect parents, that protect children, because right. we're protecting parents, but we're protecting parents' rights to protect children. And then the other problem that we have in Indiana is that we have a lot of laws with no teeth. Oh, okay. So, and of course, you know, people ask me, did you support 1134? And I, I tell people, no. I mean, it was completely butchered, but I, I can't even tell you what the original bill said now. I can look it up. Right, because right. It, so butchered by the end because there was so much that was taken out and put right. in and and here and there but again none of that would have mattered at all sb 17 which was as you know simply mm -hmm. to get material inappropriate for kids out of schools and a lot of people don't know that really it was to remove a loophole in indiana right. law that says that if you or i give our neighbor's child a book that is deemed inappropriate, we can be charged with a felony. But I don't know who did it, but someone, when those original laws were made, it made it so that K through 12 was discluded from that. Not even right. colleges are discluded from those right. rules if right. those books get in the hands yeah. of children. And so somebody actually probably convinced the legislator that, oh, we can't have this law there because then a teacher can be charged for showing a biology book, which is obviously not what any of us no, are no, talking that, about, but right. we're simply trying to close a loophole there. But having said all of that, 
SB 17 would have been completely worthless if there was not a penalty behind it. Right. And then the teachers union say, oh, you want to persecute teachers. You want to charge the teachers with felonies, you know, and, and these things. And it gets really messy. Right. Of course, everybody loves the police. Everybody loves the teachers. But without, without penalties, these laws mean nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and also, you talk about the exemption for the K through 12, and that also applied to public libraries. Right. Yeah. So you could, I mean, if you're not careful, if you just let your kids running free in the children's section, right. they, they can still be exposed to those kind of pornographic right. materials. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, uh, in a way, it's unbelievable that this could happen. And also, uh, even the bill could not pass. Uh, it's basically, yeah. So it shows that uh, really parents need to get involved. And so I'm really appreciate like people like you are kind of really, uh, you know, uh, decided to run for this for the office because that takes a lot of time. And uh, yeah, in a way, it's a uh, uh, yeah, it definitely will be attacked, <laughs> right? Right. right. Well, when I, when yeah. we decided that I was going to run, because it wasn't just something I woke up one day and said, "Hey, let's run for office." Right. So I was actually testifying on um, on Senate Bill seventy four two years ago that mm. would have made it illegal for a business to fire or terminate based on vaccine status, and that was really uh, it. Was my senator who held that bill hostage in committee? He wouldn't even take it to a committee vote, so oh, it couldn't wow. even go to the floor. Right. And that, and uh, someone who was there testifying also said to me, uh, "You're going to have to primary him." Right. And I said, oh, okay. "I'll help you. I'll help you find someone." Yeah. Well, as it turned out, he's retiring. Uh, but wow. they also, when they redrew the Senate lines, they put every inch of Zionsville in one district, mm -hmm. except my subdivision and half of the apartment complex, townhouse complex next to me. And they <laughs> moved the district that I'm currently in all the way past Crawfordsville. And they put me sandwiched in between with a district that's not up for reelection. Um, there's actually Senator Buchanan um, is the senator who will become our senator and he's a newer senator who i know has uh, i hear has been working on the education law so i hope that he will do some good things with that um, but then they redrew the house lines and i thought right. well that's that's perfect i'll run for the house but it really was a process um people trickling different pieces of legislation to me and so one night i was laying in bed with my husband and somebody sent me a bill um, that actually had to do with abortion. Mm. And I looked at my husband, I said, that's the hill I'll die on. And okay. so I said, I think I'm going to have to run. And he looked at me and said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently others knew before I knew. But yeah. I, it, it was never a, it, it wasn't a far-fetched idea that one day I would run for something. I just didn't know that it would be at this time. Right. But when we decided I was going to run, we decided if I'm running, I'm running to win. I have six kids. We have two businesses. Uh, we have a busy life, and I'm not. I'm not playing, right? There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of time involved, right. and so, so, you know, people say you're so busy. How do you have time to do that? Well, things had to get changed, right? You know? so yeah, you move and, one thing in order to do, right? And also one. the so the priorities, right? right. Exactly, yeah. and this is this is this is the priority. I mean, right. we're going to lose Indiana as a conservative state, if we don't do something now, we're gonna, we're gonna lose our children. Right. We're gonna, we're losing too much already. You know, this is not the state that I moved to 16 years ago, but we need to go back. And people say, you know, why are there so many, so many people primarying and challenging Republicans? It's, it's funny to have Republicans challenging Republicans and it's because our current Republicans, many of them are not, they're not even following the Republican platform. No, 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 exactly. No. Yeah. And, and also uh, uh, the, 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 the establishment, right? They, they will put a lot of, uh, I mean, they have, they have uh, their people, they want to, uh, right. to run, so. Oh, absolutely. Well, and they, and that was interesting because um, I was, the first one who announced I was running and then um, further into it, somebody else announced, 
but two days before the deadline to register, mm -hmm. um, the House recruited somebody to run. They recruited a past uh, representative who is a professional lobbyist who has, uh, he was in the House for 11 years. He became a professional lobbyist. He's been parliamentarian to the Speaker mm -hmm. of the House. Mm -hmm. He's one of the biggest donors to our current and past Speaker. They absolutely 100% oh, wow. recruited him to run against me. And then somebody else asked another person uh, to do that. But my major competitor is a professional lobbyist. Oh. Uh, right now it's looking really, really good. Uh, as far as our camp campaign goes, but we have three weeks and right. we are on guard. You know, we don't know what's going to happen, what they're going to do. We have our plan. We're focused. Yeah, right. um, we know what we're doing, but we also were, yeah. our peripheral vision is, is definitely watching what's happening in the background. So, yeah. well, to me, uh, uh, like in the past, I just run, like just vote. I never involved in the primary. I just in the in the, in the general election. I just run, uh, you know, I mean, strike ticket. And uh, but now after seeing what happened, um, uh, I think uh, if I see someone who is uh, either an incumbent or a professional, <laughs> uh, to me that is the automatically a no vote. Um, yeah, it's much better to get people like you who actually lived in the district, I me mean, have kids and uh, you, you have a lot of stake, right? right. Uh, well, I want people to understand that it's not about me. It's not about any individual candidate. Right. Um, you heard nicely. He will say, it's not about him. It's about the collective. And so we need to get enough people in there that are willing to fight, that are willing to say, look, we respect what you're saying, you know, to the, to the leadership, However, we are here to fight for the people of right. our district. Yep. And if we, when Kurt Nicely was in there by himself, he couldn't do anything. Right, he had right. to have someone to second him. So then, you know, they had a second person in there, yeah. John Jacob. John Jacob, yeah. He could second them. But at some point in time, I truly believe with everything in me that the Republican, that the Republicans in there were told if Kurt Nicely or John Jacobs brings a bill up, even if we agree with it, the vote is no. Right. If they bring an amendment up, the vote is no. Right. And I had a representative um, who I've had a good relationship with for several years. She said to me, oh, that amendment must not have been on the House floor. That must have been in the Senate um, in regards to voting law. And I kind of kept my mouth shut at that point in time, but I absolutely 100% know that it was on the House floor because Kurt nicely brought that amendment that had to do with uh, with trying to fix the law because as we know that the Indiana Constitution says that you have to be 21 to run as a representative, hmm. but they changed the laws so you have to have voted in two Republican right, right, right. primaries. The Democrats did it too, and a 21 year old couldn't have done that. So right. he was just trying to fix it. So there was another way to certify someone's party affiliation. And they voted no on that. And I don't believe that representative was lying to me. I believe they were told, we vote no on all amendments from Kurt Nicely. Yeah. And so when Kurt Nicely got up there, they didn't even need to know right. what he was saying because it was an automatic no. And yeah. this isn't fair to the people of, of Indiana. I mean, we need to be able to have fair debate on the right. floor of the House. So yeah. we need enough people in there. It's not going to throw the Republican supermajority, but we need enough people in there so that, you know, the establishment, well, for two reasons. Number one, we need the establishment to understand that you're going to have to listen right. to the representatives who are representing. And I do believe that we have some other representatives in the House who are trying to fight a little bit harder, but they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of getting blacklisted. Right, right. And I, I'm hopeful that they will kind of come out right. and, and fight harder if we get more people in there. So it's not about me. The only, the only thing that makes it about me is that I'm not bought and I'm willing to go in and fight and I don't have anything to lose. Right. I mean, literally, I'm... There are causes I'm literally willing to die for at this point in time. Right, and right. my children hope that doesn't happen, but they're 
there are literally causes I'm willing to die. That's right. Okay. Yeah, e exactly. I mean, so yeah, I really appreciate uh, that you are uh, running this race. And uh, I know uh, John Jacob for many years before he uh, became a re representative. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's really a, a, a good man and a, a solid Christian. Uh, he re really, uh, really, really passionate about uh, uh, abolishment of abortion in this yes, state. Yes. Yeah. But uh, he has been, you know, harassed by the establishment. Um, yeah. And he and said he, he never saw it coming. I mean, he just, he said, you know, all the work that he has done, you know, outside of abortion clinics and such being spit on, yeah. having things thrown at him, he had never been so harassed and bullied as when he got to the state house. And right. that's not okay. That's no. that's not okay. And I don't think people of Indiana are are okay with that at no. all. We cannot have bullying going on in our state house. We, can, yeah. we can't have that happening. And uh, and so we, I don't know when that became okay. I think it became okay a long time ago. Oh yeah, we really, yeah. We really yeah. need to change that. Yeah, well, if you look at the history, I mean, that's the kind of practice has been there, right? Um, I don't, just like say, we don't know when it started, but probably a long time ago, when you get a bunch of people get together, they are making into these groups, right? They are going to push people who are not uh, play. <laughs> well with them and uh, yeah and then the, those uh you know big business and interest groups and the lobbyists and also the teachers union has a lot of uh uh a lot of uh how to say a lot of weight uh yes. that they can put on yeah like like uh, you mentioned earlier when we uh we're trying to uh get the bill like uh the HB 1134, and there is one before that, I forgot uh, the, the non, I forgot the name, but that got been uh, uh, kind of withdraw. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, teachers unions there. Um, oh, yeah. uh, they have a huge influence on, on the legislatures. Yeah, they absolutely do. Something else that I find really interesting is that the Republican party, uh, has said that they want more women and minorities um, in the party, in the House. Um, but 17% of the um, House Republican caucus is, is female. Hmm. And, um, you know, because you can have white Hispanics and people that are different nationalities that are white, uh, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'm not sure there are any minorities in the Republican House caucus right now. Okay. Um, and if if there are, you know, it's one or two. Obviously, Victoria Sparks was there and she was a powerhouse. I was sad when she left the Senate, but she's doing great things in Washington, okay. D.C. But we do, we have quite a few women running this time. Right. Uh, we have Richard Bagsby, who's running um, in District 41, I believe right. it is. He is amazing. He is a, um, a Black man yeah. uh, with an amazing family. Mm. And yet we're not being supported. And we're not, and we're being fought and we are strong Republican conservatives who believe in the platform. Right. So the only explanation for why we would be fought is that the establishment has an agenda. But right. That's not fair to the people of, of Indiana. Right. So, I mean. Yeah, you know. in, in a way you are the outsiders, right? So right. they they in a way they they uh think people like you as threat right. to to their power right yeah. right well and and i didn't i didn't expect um their endorsements i didn't expect their support right and i don't really let my mind go here anymore but i would ask them if any of them are watching this i mm. i hope they are what is it? What is it that would make you not support candidates like like myself, like Richard mm. Bagsby? Right, right. Quite nicely, he's right. one of the nicest guys. I mean, his wife is amazing. They are right. the nicest people. What is it? Because if you go through the Republican platform, we check it off. 
Mm-hmm. We, we check it off, you know, all of those issues. And, you know, it's really a question. Well, please, please tell us what we stand for. And the answer is that we're friends with Kurt Nicely. I mean, like yeah. that's honestly, truly like why there was um, a, a pro-life endorsement that I did not get. We thought they were going to stay out of our race. It's the biggest pro-life organization in the country and we were shocked when they endorsed my opponent who was a lobbyist Uh and and we thought what are you doing and actually um it was sent to me but the survey that i filled out i had a 100 percent rating on that and my opponent did not Mm. and what it came down to was that um what we understand is that they endorsed him as a favor to another representative or because he had worked for another representative who um, had worked with them in the past. And, but I assure you, my opponent is not going to fight for that legislation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go with the flow. Yeah. If the if the party leadership puts forward a bill, a life at conception bill, go go with the flow. But he's not going to go in there mm-hmm. and fight for that. And so it's but anyway, and yeah. I'm not so, concerned so, because so, our level of support is tremendous. Um, I can share now because right. the numbers are out there. We have raised, we are just under $30,000. And none of that money is from any organizations. I mean, it's been amazing. We've woken up to you know $1,000 donations from strangers, from a $2,000 donation mm. from people involved with the truckers convoy, mm. you know. The $2 bills that come from the 93-year-old woman who said wow. she's been voting ever since it was legal for her to vote. Wow. Um, the prayers that are put in those notes from people, you know, our average donation before I sent out my district letter about a month and a half ago was $25. It, I would say now our average donation is probably around $100, but almost $30,000 we wow. have raised that's from amazing. the people. You're right. And that's, that's amazing because- Every dollar bill represents at least one vote. Right, so, exactly. You know, we we really we have met thousands of people, and uh, we have a lot of support. So we'll see what happens on May third. I mean, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, are you okay to to reveal the name of that organization? The organization, the, this um, national organization, which yeah, it was Right to Life. It was. Okay. Yeah, it was right to life. So, and it was the Indiana right to life. Right, right. Uh, and, but what the irony of that is that for the last 25 years, I have been involved with right, right to life. Um, mm-hmm. Not as, not as a, um, as a chapter leader, but I have a degree in youth ministry and, oh, okay. business. and so actually um, my husband and I, right after we got married, we took um, a group of dozens of teens to the March for Life. We've been in the March for Life multiple times. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been donors to Right to Life even since the pandemic, um, wow. you know, different projects. We're actually really good friends with uh, the head of one of the local organizations and they're mm-hmm. not the ones who do the endorsements. They didn't oh. have anything to do with that. Um, but at, at this point in time, you know, if, if you look at where their endorsements are, it is all establishment. They did not endorse any of the outliers. They didn't endorse Kurt Nicely. Um, they didn't endorse John Jacobs. <laughs> We're not surprised <laughs> that they didn't oh. endorse him. Um, but, but the other thing is that somebody was told that the other reason they didn't endorse me was because of my relationship with another pro-life group, which doesn't make any sense at all because but i mean every state the that is that is an interesting thing that happens in the legislature and i saw that going back to that sb 74 in 2020 with the medical freedom it was really interesting to see those senators actually try to pit the medical freedom groups against each other Mm. and um, divide and conquer and they were successful and at first i thought Surely they're too busy to know what they're doing. And then mm-hmm. I realized they know exactly what they're doing. Okay. They know, they know exactly what they're doing. They they love to divide the movements from inside right. yeah. because it, it depowers us. Right. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Makes well, us work against each other. Yeah. And well, that's how they, yeah. That, 
They are they are good at playing those kind of games. Yeah, they're very good at <laughs> they are professionals. The National Education Association does not work with purple for parents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is for sure. <laughs> right, right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for you are welcome. The interview. Uh, this was fun. Right. So after you review it and if you're okay with it, I'll just make that public. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Peng. Uh, I enjoyed welcome. talking to you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.